I'm Yuri Koda, and my disease is distal myopathy. Uh, HIBM, DM, RV, GNE myopathy. When I was 20 years old, I feel some abnormal change with my legs. And when I was 22 years old, I was diagnosed as distal myopathy. When I was 26 years old, I began to use wheelchair because I couldn't work as usual and I had baby so I and my husband and my baby go outside together. My name is Josh Grisdale and I've, I'm from Canada and near Toronto originally and I've lived in Japan for about eight years now. I have what's called cerebral palsy and it means that I had uh, brain damage when I was a kid. It might have been a high fever I had when I was about uh, six weeks old. So, and after that, uh, it affected my arms and my legs, uh, so I can't move them as I intend to. And uh, so it's sort of a communication between my brain and my body is the problem. My name is Tsuchiyami Nekatsu. I'm in Step Edoga. I'm a gym director. I was injured for 28 years ago. So I was in a hospital and I was living in a hospital. So I came to Tokyo and I came to Tokyo for 12 years. I came to Tokyo for 12 years. Medical care and help are the Japanese government pay for us and we pay around 10%. Uh, it depends on their salary. To add to what Yuriko is saying, there's a cap on the monthly amount you'd pay. Additionally, if you're low income, you'd pay less than someone with a higher one. Actually, a benefit for me in the way that the system is set up in that it's not necessarily uh, distributed by the country as much as through the city. So if you um, are living in a city and you're registered with the city and you pay your city taxes, then you're eligible to receive the city services. Uh, and so that's who is in charge of sort of uh, dispensing the helper time and uh, some of those accessibility services and stuff. So. Even though I'm not a Japanese citizen, I'm still able to uh, receive those things as a citizen of my, or of a resident of my city. So it's more residence than um, nationality. And I can change depending on which city you live in as well. Um, so if I move to a different city, then I'd obviously fall under that city's situation so I could change what services I receive and stuff. So. ま、僕らが受けているのは障害者のための、あの、法律の中での解除サービスですね。お年寄りとはまた違います。介護保険とは違う障害者だけのサービスですね。その中に、あの、ホームヘルプサービス、介助のための、ヘルパーさんを、あ
一番やっぱり価値観が違う方の生活をサポートするっていう時にその自分の価値観を押し付けないようにするとかっていうことかなとは思います。あ,のあくまでその生活の主体は利用者さんなのであの我々はそれをサポートしてるっていうことを忘れないようにっていうのは思いますね。By myself, I can type and I can handle write in my wheelchair and brush my teeth with an electric toothbrush. Other activities I cannot do by myself. When I travel, I am、um, with husband, but、uh, in my house, I ask some helper to help、uh, wash dishes or laundry or、um, clean my house. The three main types of help that I saw provided were for physical needs, like assistance going to the washroom or getting dressed, daily life needs, like cooking food and cleaning, and social well being needs, like traveling outside of the home to interact with others and the world. I asked how the help was provided, and it turns out it depends on the individual and the company providing the support. Since every individual's needs differed, so did the support they received. I asked. 就寝,寝る時の解除をしてもらうように朝昼晩というふうに区切っている日もあればあのトイレやお風呂の日のようにちょっと長めにとっている日もありますで週末はお休みなのであの外出遊びに行ったりしてます、はい、あの1ヶ月前にはシフトが決まってあのどのヘルパーさんが何時に来るというのが決まりますあのまあ、ヘルパーさんが来てもらって生活はできているんですけれどもそのやる内容に制限がありますね自由完全に自由というわけでもないというところですねで時間数の問題もあの何年も前から僕らはあの言っているように柔道の人ほど解除時間は必要なんだけれどもエドワークとしては24時間出てないというところはあのこれからも課題かなと。いうところです。柔道の人でも24時間出てないあの生活が大変だというところですね。Going into making the documentary, I didn't quite realize the amount of care needed. So I asked Josh how it felt to have a helper with him for many hours of the day. Having the helper, you know, helps me do a lot of things, obviously. But at the same time, it's nice to have you know, personal time and you know, not, not so always having somebody beside you. And, but the problem is also, you know, because of this lot of personal care things I can't do on my own. So, I am limited by how long I can be on my own. And so, yeah, there can be, it can be a kind of a fifth wheel, so it can be difficult to go out with your personal friends and have another person around sometimes.、Uh, but at the same time, you know, if I need to use the washroom, then I need to have that person somewhere nearby. So, sometimes you can get people to come with you and just wait somewhere. But,、um, but some companies that、uh, dispatch the helpers, they're worried that they might get in trouble from the city if they're. The person's not nearby to help you, so they don't like you to tell them to wait somewhere completely far off.、Um, so it can be a bit difficult for you know, personal life sometimes. As Yuriko said, her husband acts as her helper when she wants to go out and do everyday activities like shopping. She finds department stores are very wheelchair accessible. This is because some of the small and older family run stores that were built many years ago. Don't always have the same space to accommodate wheelchairs. As you can see in department stores, which often have supermarkets, there's plenty of space for her wheelchair. And yeah, that's the Ghostbusters theme song. What's also nice about Japanese department stores is they often have a section of ready to go food which is found on the lower floor. はい、1つください 
While some older style buildings simply don't have the space, some do have little ramps like this which help bridge the gap. えっと、ま、僕が怪我したのはもう本当に28年前なので、その頃僕自身も制度のことは全く知らなかったんですね。だけれども、あの、自宅とか家とか、あの、施設で発生活している分にはその制度的な部分というのが全く僕自身知らな
uh, handles on stuff on the uh, on the inside as well. And then uh, moving back here, I have yeah. This is my helper at that time. And uh, over here, I've got my bed, and um, it's actually it's sort of like a hospital bed, so you can uh, lift up the feet and stuff like that. So the city helped pay for um, the cost of my part of the cost of my bed. On the side of the bed, in that sort of tangle of cords, uh, is the interphone. Now, normally that's sort of on the the side of the wall somewhere, but because if I'm in bed, I can't uh, open the door if it's on the wall. And so I was able to put the interphone next to my bed. So whenever somebody comes in the morning to help me get out of bed, then I can open the door. Yeah, and then once when my dad was visiting, he went to the local hardware store and he bought some uh, wood and he made a fence for me, uh, sort of a the ramp to go outside. This is my pet rabbit. Yes, sir. You're famous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never particularly was like, oh, I really want a rabbit. It was more that I didn't want a dog because I wouldn't be able to take care of him well enough, I didn't think. Mm. Um, and also a cat, I was afraid that if he ran away, I wouldn't be able to chase after him. So, uh, and this is sort of the easiest thing to take care of that has a personality. Uh, this is where I spend uh, too much time probably, uh, in front of my TV, which also has a computer there, so I uh, do a lot of my work there as well as uh, just relaxing. And I have a, this table that uh, is adjustable and also movable um, that you know I can use for dinner or putting the keyboard on and stuff like that. So it's all about adaptations. So there are group homes in Japan. So people with disabilities would maybe live in the same house and there would be staff that could take care of their needs. Um, and these would be subsidized by the, the government in some way. Um, and unfortunately that's probably, they used to be the norm, but a lot of people are moving to independent living in the big cities. Um, so where they'll have helpers come for a certain number of hours a day and they can do things more freely. Um, but that's obviously dependent on staff. And as you move out into the country, then there are fewer, fewer people who can help. Um, so it's just not feasible to run some sort of independent living helping program. Um, so people either move into the cities or they uh, would live in a, a local group home or something like that. And group homes do exist inside uh, the city as well. Uh, and it's sort of probably, depending on the needs of the person with a disability, um, if they have uh, developmental challenges or something like that, or need some more intensive assistance, then that would probably be where they would go. But otherwise, people would maybe live on their own, kind of thing, I think, so. Something I was quite curious about was how the general public treated disabled people. One of the reasons is that I used to read about Japan's disabled being hidden away, and when I started living in Japan, I'd have to say that I didn't seem to see as many disabled people out and about as I would in Canada. What I found out is a lot has changed in Japan over the past couple decades. Uh, I think in Canada, uh, people with disabilities were much more active in society for a longer time, so people were maybe more used to seeing people in wheelchairs. Uh, when I first came to visit Japan, uh, about 12 years ago, um, at that time, there really weren't as many people out with, uh, in wheelchairs at the time. So I got, on top of being a foreigner, of course, I got the extra uh, you know, looks of being somebody in a wheelchair. And uh, you know, I think people were not necessarily, I think it was very intriguing and maybe encouraged people, I think. Um, so at that time, I, was, I got a lot of looks and the sort of special treatment is kind of odd, but um, even the past, a couple of years, it's sort of, I've sort of, in a, in a good way, sort of blended in with everybody else. And, uh, you know, it's, people are more used to seeing people with disabilities out in the streets and in society. And uh, so I think everybody sort of gotten used to it, which is a great thing, I think. So. In U.S., they know about Lady First. And they take care of child or a lady. But in Japan, <laughs> they were samurai samurai culture, so they don't know how to treat weak person. So I think the Japanese people should know how to support more uh, weaker person. So I think in Canada probably people are a bit 
more upfront and they'll come up to you and ask if you need help and stuff like that. Whereas in Japan, people can often be quite shy. Um, and, you know, it depends on the situation, but maybe somebody might find that the people don't care or something like that. But I don't think that's the case. I think the other person is very aware that of something, but they don't, they're worried they might offend you or they're quite shy because, you know, if you don't, they don't know how to react maybe, like if you, if you need help or if you don't need help. Or, so I think maybe you might find less help in Japan, but at the same time, if you're a foreigner, then you also might find more help. So it really depends on a lot of case by case, I think. But um, for the most people, I think, for the most part, I think people are very eager to help, but just not sure exactly what's best, so. Maybe they are just confused. And so they are honest, Japanese people are honest, but they don't know, just don't know how to treat or how to support the disabled people. There are special school for disabled people, so um, they cannot go regular school, so they separate it between uh, normal uh, kids and disabled kids. So kids don't know how to support disabled kids and become adult. It's very problem. Sorry, problem. Yeah, so that's a, an area where I think probably Japan needs to work a little bit more on. Um, there are a lot more separate schools uh, for people with disabilities. Um, in Canada, when I was growing up, uh, you know, there, there had been separate schools, but my mom worked really hard to make sure that I was always included with everything. And so uh, when I went to kindergarten, I went to a, a normal school and I, I grew up with the same kids up until elementary and then high school. And so I was attended a normal school and there were maybe in our area, there was a class that was especially dedicated for people with disabilities. They maybe couldn't go in with the regular stream, um, but they were still included in the same school building. Whereas a lot of times in Japan up until recently, a lot of people have been, you know, they go to a separate school. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, um, it would be just because of physical disability, not necessarily to do with the ability to learn. And so somebody with normal ability to learn would be going to that school and, you know, would have to, uh, wouldn't be making the same education at, as at a regular school. Now things are changing. There are obviously exceptions to those things. But um, I think a lot of times, a lot of the kids are more in a sheltered kind of life here than they are maybe in Japan, or sorry, in Canada. Um, recently on the news actually, uh, for children with disabilities that are maybe five or six or years old, but they have trouble walking, they're not quite big enough for a wheelchair, so they'll use some sort of a, a special adapted um, stroller, um, but because it's not really something that was really recognized in Japan, um, they wouldn't get the same help as somebody in a wheelchair, even though it was necessary. So if they go to a station, the station attendant wouldn't help them with a slope or something like that, and they'd get a lot of looks because why is this big kid in a, in a stroller? Um, so there's been a, a campaign to make these little stickers they put on the you know the stroller wheelchair uh, to raise awareness. So people are getting out more involved now, but in there are some ways I think you know it's not as advanced or progressive as Canada is. In comparison to other societies, Japanese like to follow rules. This means a well-organized society. But at the same time, it can mean that it's difficult for people to bend the rules for special cases. Um, and I've, I've come across that a couple times where, you know, it's maybe not necessarily following the rules, but, it, you know, if they let me do this, then I can enjoy whatever it is I'm trying to enjoy in the same manner as everybody else, but it's just a little bit different. But, uh, you know, because the staff know the rules and they're maybe not... Uh, in a position to make the decision on their own, they'll just be hesitant to try and they'll just say no instead. Um, for a example, um, I went to a train museum and I wanted to look at this one display uh, where they're having a show for these mini trains or something. And I wanted to just go up to the display and look at it. But I was told by staff, no, no, people in wheelchairs watch from here. And I was like, well, but this, you know, this, it hasn't started yet. And it's like, but I just want to go look, I'll come back, don't worry. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, but you know, if there's a fire or uh, something happens, then you'll get in the way of other people. And you know, even there's, there's plenty of room and there's barely anybody there. Um, it's just, you know, those, the rules and that person didn't feel they had the authority to say, yeah, it's okay, you can go. You know, whereas maybe 
in places like where more individuality and taking a lot more personal responsibility, they'd be like, yeah, it's okay, you can go for it, I understand. Um, in Japan, sometimes you come across like, I don't think we can do that, you know, because we've never done that before and so we don't want to try, which can be a bit difficult for people with disabilities, with disabilities particularly. In Japan, just because of the living conditions of, you know, everybody, there's not a lot of space, especially in Tokyo. So maybe people who are used to North American sized buildings might be surprised by the, the compactness of stores here. And that can cause a bit of problems sometimes if you're in a wheelchair because you just can't get through. If you go to a Japanese style restaurant in a, in a brand new office building or something like that, they'll often have a step that they've artificially built there because it feels traditional. It can be a bit sad sometimes when you want to go out somewhere and um, you can't get in even though you know, it's a new building and you should be able to get in. When I was diagnosed as my disease, there are no elevator at my station. At my station. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, I began to use wheelchair when I was 26 years old, 2006. They installed an elevator. So it's very good for me to go outside using uh, public transportation. So become um, easier to go outside for wheelchair uses and become accessible. And 2020, there will be held Olympics and Paralympics. So Japan will be more accessible. Yeah, I think that uh, Canada definitely has a, a, an image as being a very progressive country, and I think it is for sure. Um, but Japan, well, it was playing a bit of catch up. I think it's even surpassed Canada now in many ways. Um, for example, I can use a lot of the Japanese services for having personal care attendants come, and I get actually more time than I w was getting in Canada. Um, in addition to that, I think the biggest thing for me anyways, is uh, I was living in the country in Canada, out in, in the middle of nowhere, and uh, if you don't have a car, then you can't go anywhere. And everything depends on asking people for rides, and on top of that, if you use a wheelchair, then you have to have an adapted vehicle, which can cost maybe $80,000 or $100,000. Um, and sometimes, you know, you get money from the government, but it's, it's only maybe $20,000 or something like that, so you have to pay the rest yourself. So you're really limited into where you can go and everything. Whereas when I came to Japan, um, living in a big city with an incredible uh, infrastructure for getting around in trains and such, uh, it's really opened up a lot of my world here. And so I can go to so many different places by myself uh, and just quite live a, a very full life here. As much as there are great facilities in Japan, knowing how to best access them can be a challenge. Yuriko recognized this and entered a Google Impact Challenge contest. Uh, I got grand prize from Google Impact Challenge. So that is financial support. I want to build new application app for which I use this. The idea is a barrier-free and accessible map, which will be created by collecting user-submitted data on barrier-free routes and facilities. In this project, I learned a lot about what it's like to live with a disability in Japan and the government supports in place. Much has changed in the past 20 years, and in fact, just in 2016, a new law to eliminate discrimination against people with disabilities has been enacted. Some have felt that the new law doesn't go far enough, but I do think it's a sign that changes are going in a positive direction. Living in Japan with a disability is by no means perfect, but it's good to see that the advocacy work of people like Josh, Yuriko, and Tsuchiya-san are improving things. あの、I'd like to give special thanks to Yuriko, Josh, Tsuchiya-san, and Adachi-san for letting me interview them. Also thanks to Agatha for assisting me. 
Yuriko has a great series on YouTube about traveling around Japan and the world in a wheelchair, so make sure to check it out. Josh is the guy behind Accessible Japan, which is an English site that helps people with disabilities navigate Japan, so make sure to check that out too. And thanks to all those who have supported these documentaries on Patreon. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side.